Hi and welcome to another episode of Ask GMBN Tech, the questions and answers session all about Mountain Tech. Uh, if you've got any questions about setup, servicing, what bikes are cool, geometry, any of that stuff, uh, get involved in the comments underneath. Uh, use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Uh, don't forget as well to subscribe, get the notifications on so you know when we put another video up. Uh, we might be featuring your question next time. Right, first question, this is a cool one. Are bar ends making a comeback? I've been seeing a rise in new alternative bar configurations and people, uh, budget e-bike consumers um, there, looking for more comfortable hand positions at cheap prices. Seems like a budget way to experiment with hand positions. Do you know what? I actually think that they might get a bit of a resurgence. Now, there's a friend of mine who works for Giant Bikes, he's like an industry contact I've known for years. He's raced every type of mountain bike, uh, but he still always goes back to like XC endurance style events and he's an absolute beast. And he has actually just fitted some retro bar ends that he was given by Greg Herbold, I think, for, you know, like in uh, early 90s, made by Onza. So you're probably familiar with the company Onza that make tires, or well, they used to make bar ends and loads of other stuff. So these are titanium L-bend bar ends, go on the end of your bars, and they give you two extra positions to rest your hands, change your hand position, get out the saddle, use a different position. And, you know, he was saying basically on endurance races, he's constantly just wanting to change his hands just to sort of uh, give himself a bit of a rest, actually. And I was thinking about this the other day when one of Anna's arguments for gravel bikes is, oh, they're more comfortable because you can change your hand position. Well, I'd rather put a pair of bar ends on my bike than have a gravel bike with drop bars, that's for sure. Um, that's just me, but yeah, I reckon bar ends could well make a resurgence and they make a lot of sense for cross country and in, in particular cross country endurance style riding or anywhere where you're just spending a lot of saddle time. And it's got to be a cheaper way than buying a gravel bike and it just gets some bar ends on there. So yeah, I'm up for that. Bring them back, why not? Um, next up is from Ryan. I recently picked up a mid-90s Gary Fisher Big Sur. Nice. And was curious as to what you would do with it. My regular ride to 2019 Transition Centennial, um, sort of Sentinel, great bike, uh, seems to do everything well. I've seen people convert these old bikes to gravel bikes. My question is, do you feel these will be collectible at some point? Am I better off restoring it than converting it? Uh, there's a few things you could do with it here. Yeah, you could restore it. And yes, those things are collectible. If you want to get actual advice, on uh, you know if it's worth restoring it there's loads of really good facebook groups actually for that so i'll probably look on those because communities on those are seriously active you might accidentally find someone that's looking for that very bike and luck out on that uh, if you were to sell it i wouldn't bother converting it to a gravel bike though because let's face it it's an old mountain bike it's going to be heavier it's just it's kind of not worth the hassle you're better off building a lightweight cross-country bike um, or something else than doing that with it um what would i do with it maybe turn it into a commuter bike you know, like I appreciate the old form bikes, but I wouldn't use them for off-road use. Um, but I would quite happily, like Neil, I think, has got an old Lava Dome uh, by Kona, and he's put some full-length mud guards on it and uses it just as a around town bike. That's a pretty good use for one. You're still going to get to use it. You can make it look kind of cool on there. Um, or you can go full hipster and get one of those 20-inch cargo forks. Have you seen those? So they replace your 26-inch fork. Uh, so it's the same length as 26, but it takes a 20-inch wheel and they sort the rake out so it doesn't feel weird. Uh, but it has a big rack system built on the front so you can carry stuff. Crates of beer, crates of milk, whatever you wanted to carry. Uh, you have camera equipment if you're a photographer um, or just look cool. So there's a bit of a scene online actually appearing for some of these. Seen a lot of the stuff on Radivist. There's a brand called... Um, Sorry, I've got to look it up again, Crust. So I haven't seen them recently, but there was a thing, if you look up Crust, um, you'll see that there's loads of them online and people have done sort of these retro mod builds of them. And there's also another brand called uh, Elephant Cargo. There's a link to one on screen here, the Purple Fork. I think they're kind of cool. I'd, I'd be interested in doing one of those myself. Um, I don't know what to put it on, I've got the right bike, but hey, that's what I would do. I think that's quite a cool thing to do. Next up from Princeton Harmon. Uh, what's your guys' opinion on brands like Cube, Kona and Vitus? that have carbon front ends matched to alloy rear ends. Do you think they sacrifice the quality and price of carbon to be more friendly to the wallet, or is it an overall more economical and robust solution to having carbon frames? Uh, well, traditionally it was a pricing thing. Uh, it's easier to open a mold for a front triangle than it is for an intricate rear end, especially when the rear end is in multiple pieces as well. The front end is definitely easier to do. Uh, not to suggest that any of it is easy though, because it is a difficult process, which is why it does generally cost more. Now, Good example of this, so the Vitus, I'm gonna say it's the Escarp, is that right, Josh? I've got it wrong, didn't I? Yeah, it is, it's the Escarp. So that was a bike I rode when I went to see them for GMBN a while back. Now they had an alloy rear end and a carbon front end. And they did that basically because it was the best way to give the maximum value on 
all components on the bike, uh, but they've since upgraded that rear end to a carbon one. Um, so you can just see that that's just one way of doing things. But you could say on, on some bikes, it could be down to the intention of the use. Now there has been downhill bikes that have been carbon. They've had carbon seat stays, carbon front ends. I think Kona might have done this uh, and had an alloy chain stay. The area that takes the real beating, if you're gonna snap something on the downhill bike, that's a good contender. Much cheaper to replace an alloy one than a carbon one. Uh, so it could be good for that. But then also the ride attributes of the bike. Now, let's just say a company without the resource of a massive company like Track, for example, uh, they're gonna have less opportunity and less finances to fine tune the handling of a bike. So perhaps they're gonna go with alloy in the rear end because you know exactly what you're gonna get out of it. Whereas you could accidentally build a rear end that's far too flexible or far too stiff out of carbon. And you end up getting a bike that's not gonna handle the way you want. It's gonna be easy to get a front triangle to handle that way. So there's lots of different reasons for it. Don't be put off by it at all. Nothing wrong with either material. Next up from Chopper, will a 12 speed thumb shifter uh, SRAM Eagle NX work on a Shimano Deal XT9 speed derailleur? I would say almost certainly not. I've never tried that, so I couldn't be sure, but there's gonna be different amounts of cable pull involved there. Um, now, I'm not sure about SRAM and Shimano 12 speed. I know their cable pull is similar, and I know there are people that have used Shimano shifters successfully with SRAM derailleurs, and they've said the gearing works fine, but, um, but actually, I, I need to try it just, just to know if it works. But um, generally, you can't mix and match because of cable pulls between systems. You can, of course, use a Shimano, say, any, any Shimano 12-speed components. Uh, you could use their transmission with a SRAM 12-speed chain and cassette, for example, and vice versa. Although both manufacturers will say our systems are optimized to use uh, with their own sort of ecosystem uh, for good reason, because they design it all as a package to work well. So if you do go outside that realm, you might find certain aspects won't be quite as good. That's not to suggest it won't work though. Next up is from Narf. An actual tech question for you. Oof. Coming from a 90s bike with 90s tech to a modern bike, tire technology and design is a whole new world. But finding a front rear tire combo is still difficult. Um, is it having designated or dedicated front tire necessary? And if so, why are there so few options when it comes to dedicated front tires and a number of manufacturers? It seems there's so many rear tire options and very few front and even less front rear combos. Um, okay, off the top of my head, Maxxis, Minion, DHR and DHF. So it's a DH rear and a DH front. Uh, probably the most iconic of all of the front and rear combos. Michelin have got their Wild Enduro front and rear. Continental, their new Cryptotel. Cryptotel? Cryptotel is a front and rear specific tyre. Uh, Schwalbe Racing Ralph, Racing Ray. There's loads of them out there, actually. Uh, but the more important thing to consider is, generally speaking, you want something that's more aggressive on the front for traction, for, for your turning, and something with either a paddle-based platform on the back for getting that power down to the ground, or what a lot of people are choosing, especially in terms of those racing Ray, Ray, racing Ralph tires, is a really fast rolling rear tire, so you've got less rolling resistance. Uh, they're the two biggest things. And it's funny to talk about coming from 90s to modern day, because that kind of tech did come from then, uh, which is a great observation. I think Kona was one of the first brands to do uh, dedicated tires. They were maximum reaction, and then they did equilibrium and propulsion. Um, they did some other ones as well, uh, Agro and Honch. And then of course Panarasa did the Smoke and the Dart, uh, and then the Smoke Magic and the Dart Magic. Yeah, there was loads, Velociraptors from uh, WTB. Loads of people did front and rear specifics, but I think tech has moved on a bit, and because of the fact there's different compounds and other things at play, you can kind of fine tune what you want from a tire. But just then, kind of like a, a rear wheel drive car, you've got to be able to get the power down at the back, but you need the control at the front. So, uh, same theory, I guess. Uh, but like I said, check those tyres out, Mini and DHF and DHR. Um, we're going to put some links to them so you can just have a little look at them online. Michelin Wild Enduro front and rear, so front and rear specific tyres there. Uh, Continental Cryptotail front and rear and the Schwalbe Racing Ray and Racing Ralph. Uh, all have their own different attributes for different styles of riding, uh, some of which might suit you. Next question is from Justin Locke. In fact, the next two questions from Justin Locke. We've seen you before, Justin. I've got the SRAM Guide RE brake set on my white G180. Whew, that's a hell of a bike. Uh, when, when cornering, I hear the pads rubbing against the discs, mostly on the front. It doesn't even have to be on the trail side, it could be simply on commuting or soft cornering. Um, surely it's not normal. Okay, so if it's cornering and it's not happening when you're going in a straight line, sounds to me there's a bit of flex going on somewhere. So this could be from a number of things. I would check your front, your front axle. So. Um, if you're a SRAM on there, you've got a pair of Lyrics, I think, on that bike. Uh, if so, you want to check that the QR15 is tight. 
and pulling everything together. If it's a slight bit loose, the front wheel can move. If your front wheel can move, it's going to move when you're turning because the forces that go through it. Check the bearings in your front hub. If there's any movement there, your disc is going to rub. Uh, and finally, of course, check the actual disc caliper is central over that disc rotor as well. I would check your disc rotor bolts. Basically, check everything uh, is what I'm saying down at the front in there. But uh, unusual for it to not happen in a straight line, but when it comes to corners. So that suggests to me that there's a little bit of movement going on with your front wheel uh, within the assembly there. So check all those bolts and hopefully you'll find the culprit and the axles and all the other stuff. <laughs> uh, next question for Justin. I've got the budget SRAM NX group set on my white G180 and my 11th gear, so that's the highest, the small gear down there, keeps dropping down and then returning. All the other gears are fine. What is your solution? Uh, it just sounds like your indexing is off. So you've got to bear in mind there's lots of different things that affect your indexing on a bike. So the overall cable tension, which I think is what yours is, the jockey wheel or the guide wheel in relation to the biggest sprockets there. Uh, but it will actually change the gears or the relationship of changing from the lowest gear to so the biggest sprocket down, downwards. So that will affect things. But at your end, if it's going down into the 11th and hopping back up again, it sounds like cable tension. It sounds like there's a little bit too much cable tension and perhaps your limit screw isn't quite fine tuned enough for the chain to drop down and stay there. Minor thing, but I reckon it's the cable tension there. So first thing you can do is go up to your shifter at a handlebar, that's your right shifter, and turn it counterclockwise a couple of clicks and see if that makes a difference. I reckon it might. And there's also gonna be a video down there. So the video I'm throwing down there, I'm using a Shimano derailleur in there, but the adjustments are the same because you still adjust the inner and outer limit screws and you still adjust the cable tension and you still adjust the B screw. Uh, so that video will definitely enable you to understand at least what's going on and where the things can be coming from that you're suffering from. And the last question is from Oliver Davison. There's two questions here. First one is, I was wondering whether you should wash your bike after every ride if you live in a place that isn't very wet. I've heard washing your bike can force water into bearings and stuff. Um, well, there's excessive washing, isn't there? So if you're using a jet wash and you're really hammering the bike, yeah, you are gonna force water in over time. Even the ones that are friendly on your bike, if you repeatedly wash with them, water will get in there. You've got to remember that that's what water does. It finds a path of least resistance. It's going to find its way in. So yeah, arguably, I mean, my bike, I rode that at the weekend and it's not dirty. The tires got dirt on. Uh, the most important thing that you can do is make sure your drivetrain is clean. And of course you can just wipe a rag over the bike, you know, uh, make sure the frame is quite clean, but it doesn't mean you have to do a full lot wet wash every time. You can do a dry wash on your bike. And in fact, you can actually get dry wash products as well, which I kind of scoffed at when I first saw them, but they're genuinely quite good. Uh, it's essentially like a, a cleaner, works in the same way as using a wet wash. You would wipe it on the, on the bike, but it helps sort of pull off mud and stuff that's on there without having to do a full hose down or get the bucket and brush out. So they're actually quite worth looking at. I think I made a video on using that stuff before. And the other question says, uh, with tipping your bike upside down to let the oil drain on the fork lowers, I've heard it can be bad because it can create bubbles in your brakes and cause them to be bled. No, that's that's not strictly true. So if that if you have air in your system basically and you put your bike upside down, it's going to highlight that and your brakes need to be bled. But if your brakes are bled correctly, it doesn't matter if you store it upside down, front wheel down, it won't make any difference. Your brakes will be absolutely fine because it's a sealed system. Um, but like I said, air can get into brake systems and it will highlight the fact. So if you store your bike vertically, which is what I like to do, it can often make the air that's in the system, if there is any system, migrate up to levers, which can mean you can do a cheeky mini bleed solution, basically leave the master cylinder open, that air can migrate out a little bit more advanced. But I've got a brake hacks video on that, that's gonna be down there somewhere. Uh, so don't worry about that. The biggest thing you have to worry about when you're flipping your bike upside down to do what you're talking about is making sure you don't scuff the controls on your on the uh, handlebar set and of course scuff the leather on your saddle or the uh, whatever your saddle synthetic leather is made from. So put a rag down on the ground just to protect it, a bit of padding and you should be fine. As I said, all good. Any more questions, please do get involved and please do support us here at GMBN Tech. We love making videos for you. Uh, so if you've got any great suggestions, get involved down there and we'll see you soon. Ta-ra.